body and Glenn is out the second. Okay, we'll start with this per a tweet from Michael Benson. The WBA have now officially ordered Leo Santa Cruz to defend his WBA featherweight world title versus Lee Wood next. Wood has the WBA regular belt. Parties have 30 days to negotiate, then purse bids. And we talked about this, this potential eventuality. When exactly did the WBA intend on ordering this fight since they're supposed to be in the process of phasing out secondary titles? Secondary titles like the one Lee Wood holds. Even though by all rights, he should should be full champion. Leo Santa Cruz hasn't fought as a featherweight in over three years. You know, this is why the WBO has that rule. That rule to where they don't let one of their champions hold titles in a different weight. For example, they won't let a WBO champion at minimum weight also hold the title at light flyweight. They'll put that champion on the spot and order them to choose. The WBA has no such bylaw. Which is what makes this kerfuddle possible. As expected, the WBA has officially ordered super featherweight champion Leo Santa Cruz Cruz to face world champion Lee Wood as part of their surprisingly consistent title reduction effort. The pair have 30 days as of today, meaning until May 6th, to come to terms and avoid a purse bid. Santa Cruz hasn't actually defended his title since cruising past Rafael Rivera in February of 2019. His three appearances since then have seen him claim a gift-wrapped super featherweight belt against unranked 126 pounder Miguel Flores, lose it to Javante Davis in profoundly violent fashion, then end a 15-month layoff against Keenan Carbajal. You know, before he lost that WBA super featherweight title to Javante Davis, he was holding on to two separate WBA titles at two separate weights. One at 126 pounds and one at 130 pounds. The one at 130, that's the one he lost to Javante Davis. Should have never got this far. In a roundabout way, the WBA's refusal to do its job is what gave Wood this opportunity. Then IBF champion Josh Warrington wanted to face WBA world champion Khan Su, but the IBF refused to accept a unification with a secondary titleist and ordered Warrington to rematch Kid Galahad. Instead, Warrington vacated the title and prepared for Khan Su with what was supposed to be a stay busy fight against Mauricio Lara. We all know how that turned out. This left Khan Su to lose his belt to Lee Wood, who went on to stop Michael Conlon last month in 2022's current fight of the year, front runner. So do you get the sense that these two boys are gonna fight? I don't. My many years as a boxing fan have made me cynical, skeptical, to say the least. And Lee Wood being with Matchroom, boxing on the DAZN side of things, Leo Santa Cruz being a PBC fighter for as long as I can remember, it's hard to imagine that either one of these guys is gonna get their passport out when they have options options on their own side of things, on their own sides of the street. It's hard to imagine Leo Santa Cruz is going to book a flight to the UK. I don't see that happening. At the same time, it's hard to imagine Lee Wood's going to get his passport out to come here stateside, fight on the PBC Showtime side of things, when he has the option of staying put, staying right there where he is across the pond in the UK, locking horns with Josh Warrington for his IBF title. He's just in a fight of the year candidate with Mick Conlon. And if you put Lee Wood in there with Josh Warrington, that does very good business, does very well commercially across the pond. Lee Wood is not limited to chasing around a guy like Leo Santa Cruz for an opportunity. I'm just giving it to you straight. It's the only way I know how to give it to you. And something very similar rings true for Leo Santa Cruz. Leo Santa Cruz, who right there on his own side of things, the PBC Showtime side, he's got the winner of Mark McSayo versus Ray Vargas oh. set to go down this summer in July. You know, he did say he wants to fight Mark McSayo. He has the winner of that fight to consider. He has that option. These guys have got something like 29, 30 days to come to a deal. The question is, between now and the deadline, will Leo Santa Cruz drop the WBA title? Because if he does, he won't be under any orders, won't have any obligation to fight Lee Wood, much less enter into a purse bid. Enter into one in order to satisfy him. That's the question. Who's going to walk away before the deadline? Because somebody might. 
Both guys got reason to. Although it should have never got this far. And if it did, it's the WBA's fault. Leo Santa Cruz hasn't boxed as a featherweight in a little over three years. Hasn't boxed as a featherweight since February of 2019. Why has he been allowed to hold a title there for all this time? What's the point? They should have either elevated Khan Su to full champion status or Lee Wood after him. That's what they should have done. Leo had all but left the featherweight division three years ago. He went up there to 130 pounds, won a title up there. You're gonna let this fucking guy hold up the featherweight division when he hasn't boxed there in three years? Leo Santa Cruz is a big part of the reason the featherweight division hasn't seen any unification matches in a very long time. He's the reason for more reasons than one. Him not fighting Gary Russell Jr. on his own side of things, and this situation with the WBA. The fact they let him hang on to that title at a time when he wasn't even campaigning as a featherweight. That stopped the Kansu versus Josh Warrington unification match from happening. That's what did it. Because Kansu was a WBA secondary champion, because he wasn't elevated to full champion status, his fight with Josh Warrington was not approved as a unification match by the IBF. So the IBF went ahead with their orders. At which point, Josh Warrington dropped the red belt and the rest is history. Leo Santa Cruz is the catalyst for all of this, the common denominator in what has stifled today's featherweight division for a very long time. He didn't unify with his PBC stablemate, Gary Russell Jr., back when Gary was a champion, and he's been an absentee champion at featherweight for the last three years. So I'll be honest, I don't think Leo Santa Cruz and Lee Wood are going to fight, I don't. They got options on their own sides of the street. It's not a question of whether or not they're going to fight. I don't think they're going to fight. It's a question of who's going to walk away first because if it's Leo Santa Cruz that walks away, he'll effectively vacate the WBA super title at which point Lee Wood will be elevated to full champion. That's if Leo walks away. If Lee Wood walks away... Leo Santa Cruz will hang on to the WBA title and perhaps look to unify with the winner of Mixayo versus Vargas. In other news, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, Team Canelo will explore Better Be versus Smith winner if Golovskins loses or suffers an injury. You seen that guy? He looks old. Whenever you go up in weight, it's a risk because you're going to face fighters who are used to handling a certain amount of pounds at the time of a fight. It is a risk that Canelo takes against an undefeated fighter in Dimitri Bivol with good victories. It is an important challenge for his career, Eddie Reynoso told a los golpes. As for Golovkin, let's see how he stacks up against Murata. There are five Fighters who, from one fight to the next, can become an old man, and others who, after 40, have made their best fights. Nowadays, we don't know. We have to see how he looks against Murata. That fight is going to be the guideline to see what Golovkin offers against Canelo. If he looks good and he wins good, they'll do the fight. If he handles Rio de Murata as easily as he handled Steve Rolls, or as easily as he handled Camille Zeremata. But if it's physically taxing, like the Sergei Didivianchenko fight. Or if he goes out there and wins, but looks old and inept, he looks past it, looks like a shot fighter, well, that will take some of the luster away from a Canelo Alvarez trilogy. It would. Yeah, that'll take the air out of the tires. We have some clauses in the event that Saul does not go against Golovkin. There may be a cut, injury, accident, etc. So if we win in May, we could have the doors open to make a fight against the winner of Better Beef versus Smith. We have a good relationship with top ranks CEO Bob Arum, and it's a fight that I think is going to happen sooner rather than later. This revelation has led to a rise in individuals rooting for Ryota Murata, rooting for him to upset the apple cart for what could be old man Lofkin. Because if he loses, Canelo Alvarez's bid to become an undisputed champion at two weights will start sooner rather than later. If Golovkin wins, we know what's next. But if he loses, Canelo Alvarez will put the pedal to the metal. Could end up going from b straight into the winner of Better B versus Smith. Which would be an undisputed light heavyweight title fight, an opportunity to become a two-time undisputed champion. How many guys can say they've done that? Especially these days. Very recently, top rank empresario Bob Arum himself chimed in on the proposal, that potential situation. Arum would make a 175-pound undisputed bout with Canelo, but he questions doing it on his own. I never discussed it with Canelo or Eddie Reynoso. I'm friendly with both of them, but I never thought to discuss it at this particular point. Maybe next year or the latter part of this year. If Golovkin gets himself beat, I'm happy to discuss it. Given the state of Gennady Golovkin ahead of this weekend's Ryota Murata fight, the luck of him. Him getting beat by Murata is a genuine possibility. Seems more and more like a genuine possibility. At least in some circles. And in some circles, that's what people are rooting for. That's what they want to happen so that 
that can bring about a Canelo Alvarez undisputed light heavyweight bid sooner rather than later. So I don't think they're willing to bet on it. Because even though Gennady Golovkin is in fact an aging champion, he's 40 years old, he's been inactive the last 12 months, Ryota Murata's been out a lot longer than Gennady, twice as long. How long's it been? A little over two years since he had a fight. But again, in order to make a light heavyweight unification bout with Alvarez, you'd have to figure out how the signal for the fight is going to be distributed. Because to lock it, to fight up with the zone, which nobody watches, no place in the world really, seems kind of productive. Bob Arum didn't hesitate to take a jab at his platform rival, the rival to ESPN, you know, when it comes to boxing. I don't understand what their model is. In the United States, they're doing pay-per-view, $80. Listen, his aversion to DAZN doing that fight has less to do with how many eyes get on the fight. I mean, that's not his problem. That's not his concern. If he has an aversion to Canelo Alvarez facing the winner of Better B versus Smith on DAZN as opposed to ESPN, his aversion has less to do with how many subscribers DAZN has or how many people see the fight. His aversion has less to do with that and more to do with how he stands to benefit from it. What benefits top rank the most? Make no mistake, if they're going to do that fight, he wants that fight to happen on the top rank ESPN side of things. That's what it really is. He doesn't want to just send a fighter he's built up over time to another platform. Nobody does, really. And if Bob Arum has some aversion of his own doing that fight, as opposed to top rank in ESPN, well, that's what it really is. How many subscribers the zone has and how many people watch it ain't none of his business, and that's not his problem. So long as they can pay you a fighter, a career high purse for what is a very big fight with the cash cow of boxing in this part of the world, that's the only thing you need to concern yourself with. Whether or not they can pay your guy adequately for his time. Adequate compensation as far as viewership, that's none of your business and that's not your problem. But we all know that's not what his real problem is. What's in it for them to do it? Yeah, they get the rights for Germany, Italy. They can't be worth very much because the fight comes on over at 4 or 5 over there in the morning. UK, they've invested a lot of money in the UK. According to the UK, they ain't got 40,000 subscribers. So where are they going? I tell people, obviously, founder Len Blavatnik, the man who's the back of the company, he's put enormous sums in, maybe as much as three billion. How's he gonna get it back? I don't know, let me tell ya. People say, look at his success in music. He's smarter than you, and I would agree. I'm sure he's smarter than me. Maybe he's figured it out. And maybe you're doubting the reach of DAZN as a global platform that caters to 200 plus markets around the world, 200 plus territories. More importantly, it doesn't matter where Canelo fights, people are gonna watch. You wanna poo poo all over DAZN? Go ahead. You wanna poo poo all over their marketing strategy? Poo poo all over Len Blavatnik? If you wanna do that, you can do that. But one thing I know is where Canelo Alvarez goes, the money follows. And so does the audience. The audience that generates the money. There is reason enough to believe that Bob Arum is grossly underestimating DAZN's reach as a platform because Canelo Alvarez's fight with Billy Joe Saunders, a fight that broke the indoor attendance record for a fight here in America, that happened on DAZN. That was a matchroom promotion. If what you're saying is nobody's subscribed to DAZN and nobody watches it, then how the hell did 73,000 people know about Canelo Alvarez's fight? Who is promoting it? On what platform? I mean, give me a break, Bob. Come on. It's quite the contradiction, to say the least. The fight that broke the indoor attendance record in this country happened on a platform that nobody watches? No, that, that doesn't make sense. Nobody watches it. Nobody knows about it. They wouldn't have known about the fight. And if there were anything shoddy about DAZN's business model and their business practices, the cash cow of boxing in this country wouldn't be so interested in continually doing business with them. But, but that's what he's doing. He's doing business with them, and he's choosing to. I think the subscription model is not viable. If all you're offering a subscriber is boxing, you have to combine it with other sports and other serious things, which ESPN Plus, which has 22 million subscribers, has done. You go to ESPN Plus, you can barely find anything because there's so much on at one time. Yeah, you can have a streaming service for sports. You gotta have content. In other words, if the zone, say for the UK, also had Premier League soccer, hey, that'd be pretty good. That would be a reason to go get it. You gotta have other content. 
You can't do it with boxing alone. But they are doing it with other content. The Zone is not simply a boxing app that only features boxing matches. And while I will admit they didn't get the rights for Premier League Soccer, they got beat out by Discovery for those rights, though I've heard no new news in reference to that buyout. The Zone does broadcast more sports than just boxing, they do. Though I reiterate, Bob Arum's aversion to the fight happening on the Zone has less to do with subscribers and viewership numbers and how many eyes they can draw. It really has less to do with that, and it has more to do with him sending one of his guys to be content over there for somebody else. That's what it's really all about. If that fight's going to happen, he wants it to happen on the top rank ESPN side of things. That much is obvious. But what isn't so obvious is the outcome and the obstacles. We don't know that Ryota Murata won't upset Gennady Golovkin this weekend. We don't know that he will. But if he does... There's still some obstacles to be addressed. Canelo Alvarez reportedly entered into a two-fight deal with Matchroom. Should Gennady Golovkin not keep up his end of the bargain... Does that nullify the deal? Is it then void? It's a legitimate question. Eddie Hearn himself made some mention of Canelo potentially facing the winner of Richards versus Buatzi in the United Kingdom. John Ryder as well. Potential opponent options for Canelo should he decide to fight in the United Kingdom at some point. Would one of those guys be offered up if Gennady falters this weekend? It's a legitimate question. Would Canelo be receptive to those options if that happens? It's a legitimate question. And what about Anthony Yard? That's a legitimate question. Anthony Yard reportedly is set to face the winner of Better Be versus Smith. By way of the WBO, he is. If Gennady Golovkin loses this weekend and Canelo starts exploring the winner of Better Be versus Smith as an option, what happens with Yard? It's a legitimate question. It's not just some guy who wants a title shot. He's in a pole position to become the WBO's mandatory challenger. Say Gennady Golovkin loses this weekend. Rada beats him and Canelo beats Bivol. Becomes the WBA's light heavyweight champion. You can use a unification match to circumvent a mandatory, provided you have that mandatory's blessing. Will Anthony Yard be willing to step aside? It's a legitimate question. Select circles of boxing certain groups. They view Dimitri Bivol for Canelo Alvarez as a potential banana skin. So who says that Canelo Alvarez even makes it past that guy? That is. If he loses, what then? Well, that'd certainly throw the monkey wrench in everything now, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'll take the air out of the tires. There's much that must come to pass for Canelo Alvarez to go from a Dimitri Bivol fight straight into a fight with the winner of Better B versus Smith. And never mind that the alphabets are doing their whole... Aren't they still banning Russians and Russian fighters? That's gonna need sorting out. I get the sense that the fight will happen, though. I get the sense that the fight will come off. They'll get it over the line. 4-3 of the four alphabet titles between Joe and Artua. If that's any consolation, I'm confident it'll happen. I think Bob, he's got enough juice. He could pull some strings to ensure that it happens. Like I said, a lot must come to pass for Canelo to fight the winner.